How are we looking? Like? starting tonight very, very soon on All About Gong Fu Cha. Tonight we'll be talking about the history of tea, but also the history of where that practice of how to brew tea comes from. Uh, it's a long story, about 6,000 years, give or take. I'm going to say even more. Um, but as we go into that, we'll be brewing some teas, we'll be sharing some teas, and hopefully we'll be learning a lot more. So stay tuned. So welcome everybody. Tonight we're going to be starting with a brief, brief little presentation on uh, Gong Fu Cha, what that means, and we'll be taking you through the history of tea. Um, but again, as I said before, where tea gets its origins and where the practice of brewing tea skillfully began and how it evolved, and how it is the way we know it today. So without further ado, we're going to start by jumping into this presentation. So tonight we're going to be going through a variety of different topics that will all be touching on the aspect of what Gong Fu and Gong Fu Cha means. So it's just a brief overview. We'll be touching on things such as defining Gong Fu Cha, the origins and evolutions of what we call Gong Fu Cha, uh, and then stepping into what I'd like to call the mind and materiality of Gong Fu Cha. And then finally, the skill and challenge of Gong Fu Cha. First off, let's just define what Gong Fu Cha means. First off, before we even delve into that, let's look at the word Gong Fu. This is a term that comes up quite a bit, not just in tea, but also throughout Chinese, or Chinese culture, Chinese history. This is the same character as what we have used for Kung Fu. Kung Fu, such as like martial arts Kung Fu. Um, literally, Kung Fu or Kung Fu means work or achievement. It's a skill that's acquired through being challenged. Uh, in the terms of Kung Fu Cha, Cha being tea, the sort of evergreen that we turn into uh, the tea bush or turn into the tea leaf, um, Camellia sinensis. Um, what we're talking about here when we talk about Kung Fu is the skill of brewing tea through being challenged by the actual tea leaf itself. When you look at a tea leaf, what does it tell you? What does its shape say? What does its origin mean? How can we derive all of this information just by looking at the leaf and therefore turn that into knowledge that we can then go into brewing of that tea? And this is the basis of what we call Gong Fu, Gong Fu Cha. Again, a skill acquired through the challenge. Looking at this historically, we have what we call ancient precursors to Gong Fu Cha. We didn't quite have Gong Fu Cha, but we did have tea. We didn't have the notion of to be challenged by something and acquiring a skill, but we had the sort of base knowledge of if I try this, it will have an effect and thus 
produce this outcome. A great example of this historically is Shennong. Shennong is a, I want to say, 13th century sage. He's probably mythical, or he's probably a combination of many historical characters put together. Uh, but what Shennong is, is sort of the idea of this person going around through nature and tasting various different things and feeling the effects on his body and from that getting an idea of is this good for me, is this bad for me. And it's during this that we actually have the sort of first recognition of tea as a agricultural product uh, well before tea was used as a beverage, as something that we consume to drink and enjoy the flavor of Sully, it was something that you'd add together, uh, usually with herbs, sometimes with spices, things like salt were added, things like butter were added, uh, things like flour were added. Um, and these are things that you would mix together as a medicinal soup. And tea was one of those elements, one of these elements that was used by Shennong, or by people like him, sages, uh, apothecaries, or even sort of shamans. Let's use the word shaman here. This is kind of a uh, sort of like priest, future seer, as well as somebody who understands sort of the compendium of, of traditional medicines and their effects on the human body. Uh, someone like Shennong, a shaman you might say, would be somebody who could use tea to detoxify the body. Um, and using tea and its wild form of tea uh, that would be readily available to people within the sort of south and southwestern parts of China, um, using tea as a means of a traditional medicine. This is something that we see tea being used as at least 6,000 years ago, a long time ago. And again, Shennong is somebody who probably existed well before this and passed on via oral tradition uh, the use of tea as such. Uh, it really isn't until the third century uh, that we have the compendium of Shennong Bai Tao, the classic herbal medicine, uh, where tea is really kind of first mentioned. That's during the Han period, the Han dynasty. So, what is that, 220 to 202? That's straddling BC 80, so it's about 400 years. Moving on and sort of delving deeper into what Kung Fu is, we have this character named Zhuanzi. Zhuanzi existed during the Warring States period. This is in the uh, uh, 4th century BC, 4th uh, to 3rd century BC. Uh, he's a philosopher, he's a poet, and he's doing so kind of in the, the Taoist way. So when you see his writings, when you see his musings, he's looking at how to cultivate the way, how one can cultivate, how one walks through the world um, and gain the knowledge from observing things like nature, observing things like human nature, as well as the sort of uh, natural nature. Um, he doesn't explicitly talk about tea, but what he does talk about is a life built from the acknowledgement of how things are and cultivating in a way that's based off of uh, aspects of stepping into one's trade and sort of cultivating the manner of doing things. Uh, Burton Watson, a scholar of uh, East Asian history and translator of Zhuangzi, wrote, a skilled woodcarver, a skilled butcher, a skilled swimmer does not ponder or rationate on the course of actions he should take. His skill has become so much a part of him that he merely acts instinctively and spontaneously, without knowing why, to achieve success. And when we talk about Kung Fu, a skill that is acquired through being challenged, people like butchers, people like fishermen, people like athletes, these are people who have picked up a skill just by merely challenging themselves to do something better. And they do so day after day after day to the point where it becomes almost muscle memory, where it's no longer an intellectual term, but it itself is a sort of physical practice. People um, are asking you to be in the camera. You want to see my face? Yeah, they people? want to see your face. Okay. Listen, otherwise, it's like listening to the radio. Can you plug that in? And then, yeah. All right. Sorry. Ah. Can you see me now? This, uh, this little thing is going to like... Alright. Is it 
Is that better? You're gonna see you like need that. to you need to come close a little bit. Like that? More. A little bit more. Uh, yeah, right here. <laughs> So anyway, Zhuangzi is one of my favorite people in Chinese history. Uh, there's a good chance that he was real. Uh, his writings called Zhuangzi um, talk about, again, this notion of life in the way, and that's the big way, Dao. And again, he doesn't really talk about explicitly about tea or brewing tea, but what he does talk about is this aspect of Gongfu. He doesn't name it specifically as such, but what he does talk about become the underpinnings of what we mean uh, when we say Kung Fu, um, acquiring a skill by being challenged, doing an action repetitively to the point where you're not uh, showing physical exertion or where you're not overthinking it. A good example that it gives is of a butcher. Again, Burton Watson makes mention of this, but Drangsa talks about a butcher who's able to cleave through the carcass of an animal with a knife. And this knife never needs to be sharpened. And the reason why the knife never needs to be sharpened is because the skill of the butcher is such that he can cut between every joint of the bone, not actually ever touching the bone, not actually ever touching hard sinew. And as such, he can do so very skillfully, very gracefully, and he does so without thinking, because he's done it so many times before. This is essentially what Gong Fu is. Not applied to tea, but applied to a trade. Finally, as we get into tea, we have Lu Yu. Lu Yu was a scholar from the Tang period, uh, from 733 to 803. He's most well known for writing the Cha Jing, uh, the tea classic, or classic of tea. And it's in this text that he describes actually being one of the first to fully describe the production of tea, the brewing of tea, the procurement of tea, the procurement of water, the boiling of water, and the tea wearers. Uh, he talks about this and more in a series of texts that were later brought together during the Tang period, and it was with these texts that we see the beginnings of a codified tea culture in China. It's the first time that you ever see a singular text talking about every aspect of tea that they knew about. And it's from this text that you begin to see the either observations of or the promotion of tea culture in China. Um, remember during this time, tea was not brewed with little pots like this. This is a sort of yumi, green clay uh, teapot. Instead they were brewed in large kettles and then served in beautiful, oftentimes white or light blue or sometimes light green uh, tea bowls. So a very different type of tea we're talking about, but still tea just the same. Next we have a slew of what I'd like to call tea people, cha ren. These are people who are sort of, let's say, connoisseurs of tea, followers in the way of tea, people who owed everything that they knew to folks like Lu Yu or Tsai Shan. These are people who maybe brewing their own tea, or maybe just sitting and drinking tea, but what, when they write about tea, they write about tea in a way that talks very specifically about not only the enjoyment of tea, but the refinement of the process of making tea. And it's through the process and the refinement of that process of making tea that we have the basis of something like Kung Fu Cha. Again, the skill and challenge of brewing tea. Uh, the first is Emperor Hui Zong, and he's only first on this list. Mind you, there were hundreds of people prior to this, stretching well back into the Han Dynasty, if not longer. Um, but it's Emperor Hui Zong during the last period of the Song Dynasty uh, that he writes his Da Guan Cha Lun. And in the Da Guan Cha Lun, he talks about the brewing and appreciation of what he calls Bai Cha. Bai Cha, of course, being white tea, but during the time of the Song, we didn't really have white tea. We had green tea. We had teas that were pressed into cakes. Teas that were then ground up and whipped up in a way that is very similar to like a bowl of matcha today. Uh, what he talks about is the enjoyment of this type of tea um, and the refinement of a style of brewing tea uh, towards the end of the Song period. Um, at this point, 
during the end of the song period, he's no longer adding, you're no longer adding flowers, you're no longer adding incense or salt to the tea, as they may have done during the Tom period. Instead, they're enjoying tea for tea's sake. Uh, and this is another distinction to make when we talk about Hong Fu Chan, is that we're no longer talking about tea with things added to it, we're talking about tea itself. So, Emperor Hui Zong, being one of the many people during the Song period to talk about a refinement of tea and the brewing of tea, he is the, one of the first to talk about brewing tea itself. Next we have, at least again on this list, uh, the Ming period scholar uh, Zhu Quan. Uh, Zhu Quan talked about in his Cha Pu, the tea manual during the Ming uh, 1440, uh, not only about things such as loose leaf tea and the appreciation of loose leaf tea, being one of the first scholars to talk about the appreciation of loose leaf tea, uh, but also brewing methods as well as tea wares. Uh, and it's from this that we have the beginnings of what we call, let's, let's just say, modern gong fu cha. I know I'll get in trouble for saying that, but really modern gong fu cha, folks. It was a thing. And then finally, we have the poet and scholar Chen Gongyin. Chen Gongyin is a scholar during the Qing period. A lot of folks in the United States and in the West might not know of him. He was a uh, poet and scholar of, let's say, daily life and of the common folks. And I want to just stress that during the late Qing and, and mid Qing period, that you know, when you're talking about tea and when you're talking about people writing about tea, Going way back since the beginning of China's history, the writing and reading about tea, so the physical record of tea, is very much limited to the literati class. And when we talk about literati class in China, we're talking about a very, very small segment of the Chinese population. So when we talk about Emperor Huizong, when we talk about Zhu Quan, even Lu Yu, and even people like Shen Nong, we're talking about a person who represents about maybe, at very most, 1% of Chinese society. These are people who are literate during the ancient and early modern period of China. Uh, it isn't until modern period, until the 20th century, that literacy in China goes up to the point where you have people actively commenting on tea culture, actively accessing literati tea culture, and instead what you have is the, the abundance of common tea culture, but a lot of this is never ever talked about in Chinese literature, in Chinese writing. And it's not really until the Qing period that we do have a broadening of that discussion. Uh, and Chen Gongyin uh, is one of those first who really taps into and really delves deep into the sort of nitty gritty of common tea culture. And in this case, it's a great collection of poetry and musing that he writes about when he's looking at the tea practices and really, Gong Fu Cha, as it exists in mid to late Qing uh, Chaozhou. Chaozhou being one of the major areas and really the sort of birthplace of what we call Gong Fu Cha. So, I know I'll get in trouble for saying birthplace, we'll talk about that later. Now, going back into what we talk about, or when we talk about Gong Fu, we also, we also want to talk about not just people but we also want to talk about the forms that they're using. And so I bring just kind of to attention some of the earliest forms when we talk about tea. And that again goes back to the Tang and the Song period. So areas from the, the 7th century all the way up to the 12th century, a little bit further than that. Uh, what we have here on this side is a Qingware uh, white glazed tea bowl from the Tang period. Uh, this is a beautiful piece. It's actually, that's about the size of one of these bowls, maybe a little smaller, so maybe about that big. Um, what we see here is a very simple bowl, it's very elegant, um, and what we see here is a fairly shallow bowl. Now, during the Tang period, tea was brewed in a large kettle, as I said, a large kind of pot, and it was boiled, not frothed, whipped, or, you know, I don't know, steeped. Um, and instead it was, it was made almost like a soup. So you'd add things like green onions, you'd add things like salt to it, you might even add some flowers to it. This is all talked about in the cha jing. Yeah, it sounds gross. Yeah. Uh, I've, we've tried it here. It's not that bad. It's a little weird. Um, but because
because of that, you're not really doing anything other than drinking the tea in this bowl, in this cha one, this, this tea bowl. Um, so it being white or it being off blue or it being, you know, a, a slight cream color helps to enhance the color of that tea. But the bowl itself is just a vessel to drink the tea from. When we move over to the Song period Jian wearable, Jian wear being from the Jian kilns in Fujian, uh, this Jian wearable is a bit deeper. It's a bit more concave. Uh, it's a bit more angled in. And why might that be the case? How are they brewing tea during the Song period? That changed dramatically from the Tang period. Well, it reveals itself in this bowl. Most of the action of brewing this tea does not occur outside of the bowl, but occurs inside of the bowl. Much like modern matcha is produced, the bowl of the Song period was used as sort of the, the theater of brewing tea, whipping the tea from powdered tea into a beautiful bright foam. Uh, so not only was it nice to have a deep bowl where you could whip the tea with that whisk, I don't have one with me, but if I did, you'd see me whipping tea right now. Uh, not only that, but also the fact that the tea bowl itself is black, or in this case, kind of hair fur. It's brown, black, shiny, slightly vitrified. You get some very beautiful sort of uh, iron oxide markings on the interior. Uh, when you look into that bowl, you can see the bright white or bright green or sometimes bright sort of yellow, orange, brown. I'm kind of throwing colors out there. These are the colors of a Song period tea. And they would be in great contrast to this bowl. So the bowl itself becomes not just a way to drink tea, but also the space where tea is made. And that's something that began in the Song period, but it's something that continues even further on. And I'll give you kind of an example of this. When we talk about the gaiwan, this is the thing that we'll find oftentimes in, in Chinese tea houses, or if you're a tea person, you might have a few at home. I have a few at home, I like to break mine. I'm not very good with using a gaiwan. When we're talking about a gaiwan, what we're talking about first is a cup, the, the wan, the bowl. The gai is the lid. It's a, it's a thing that originally during the Song period, this is a Song period, uh, what we call gaiwan, all right? It's a lidded bowl, gai being the lid, wan being the bowl. This bowl, in this case, this bowl is made of jade, so it itself, jade having sort of magical properties and Taoists and sort of pseudoscience, um, this jade bowl is now the vessel of this tea. And to keep that tea both warm and also free of any particulate matter that might fly into it, well, they've put a lid on top of it. And that's going to help that tea stay warm as I pass it to you, as I pass it to you. Uh, and so you can enjoy that tea, very warm, very fresh. And again, this would probably have been whipped up tea, so you know, it preserves a little bit of the foam too. Moving into sort of the Yuan period, when we start seeing bowls like this, this is a Tibetan silverware tea bowl, we're already beginning to see a transition away from whipped tea to the sort of brewing of tea or boiling of tea and serving it, serving it up as a liqueur, as a brewed liquid, uh, similar to what we would drink if we were just drinking from a, a teacup. Now what we're doing here is we're using this guy, this lid again, as a means to keep the tea warm. But at this point, we're not doing this really to preserve anything but the warmth of the tea. All right, so it's just a lid that we put on our tea bowl. And as you can see, it's on this kind of little dais here. It's very similar to the one that we saw right here. All right, this is a car with a lacquer Dias. This one is from the Qing period, for those who know their carved lacquer. But they have these going in the Song period as well. But what we see with this is something very similar to what we saw during the Song. But that's going to go away, or it's going to transform during the Ming and Qing period. Because during the Ming, what was it, 1391, I'm thinking I'm getting that date right. In 1391, you have the edict from the first Ming emperor that no longer are we going to 
take tea and put it into cakes and then grind it up and then turn that into something similar to matcha. It's called mo cha in Chinese. Um, but instead we're going to be brewing our tea as whole leaf. So now the gaiwan, the thing that's existed since at least the Song period, is now being used as a means to brew tea. And so the kung tea, the way, the skill, informed by the challenge is changing. No longer are we talking about a bowl that's there to sort of retain the sort of heat and physical beauty or visual beauty of the tea. It's now transforming to something that's actually going to be brewing the tea. So the leaves would be inside the gaiwan, you put hot water into the gaiwan, and then you'd use that lid as a means to sift out those leaves. So it's, it's quite different in that regard. We'll go into that a little bit more tonight. If you've used a gaiwan, you know what I'm talking about. And we will, in the future, have a class that's dedicated just to brewing with gaiwan. It's also during the Ming period that we see the transition from use of bowl to use of teapot. And we see this in this great example. Where does this form come from? Well, on this side, we have the Wujing Yixing teapot. This is one of the first Yixing teapots to appear in China. This one during the early Ming period, or mid-Ming period. Uh, this, was a, this was something found in a uh, grave. Um, would have been owned by a noble person. It's quite large. This is close to actual size. It's a little bit smaller. Um, right next to it, though, we have a Song period, a northern Song period, Qing Pai melon-formed ewer. This is something that you keep boiled water in. So similar to like this being a ewer, this is also a ewer. It's funny too because you look at the old ewer shape and you look at the new ewer shape, it's actually very, very close. You see that spout. Guess who's copying who? But when we look at this shape, they take this form, they take the style that's been around for centuries now, and they adapt it to not keeping boiled water, but now brewing tea. You'd put your loose leaf tea into the, into the bowl or into the, the teapot and brew it specifically in here. And as tea people begin to realize that having a large teapot is a little harder to use than using a smaller teapot, you begin to see a shape like this, which is about the size of this. It's a little smaller. This begins to get smaller and smaller and smaller to the point that you get teapots that are this big, right? Teapots like this. Both of these teapots are about the size of an apple. This is a famous one by Shi Da Bing. Shi Da Bing is a famous potter of the late Ming period, and he was one of the first to popularize forms of Yixing teapots. So a lot of the current Yixing teapot shapes that you see, these very sort of smooth lines, slightly abstracted shapes, they might look like a pear, they might look like a, a you know, gosh, they might look like a guava, um, sort of natural shapes. He's usually the one who's behind that shape. Because he was taking natural forms and adapting them to the use for tea. What we see here is the famous Ongchen, which was made by an acolyte who snuck into a temple and saw teapots already being made in the temple and copied one, uh, using a very uh, distinctive walnut uh, shell as a means to make uh, this interesting patternation that we have on the uh, Dongchen pot. You see these all being reproduced during the Ming and later Qing period, and you can even find these being reproduced to this day. So keep your eyes out when you look for pots because you might actually find something that has its roots and origins during this time period, during the Ming and early Qing. This is when we have the beginning of a form of tea connoisseurship that is focusing less on uh, brewing tea as just a loose leaf tea and just for slacking ones first, but focusing on specific styles of tea. And why they choose pots like this, well, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but just to sort of throw it out there, these are all unglazed. When we talk about teaware prior to this, it's glazed. When we start getting into teaware from the Ming and 
Yixing period, which these are you know beginning to get towards, these are unglazed Yixing ware. This is clay that is able to absorb the flavor of tea through subsequent use and reuse of the same tea. So during the Ming period, during the Qing period, when you have the popularization and the sort of expansion and innovation on things like oolongs and hong cha and uh, green oolongs, dark oolongs, things like that, you have people focusing their attention on particular types of tea and particular types of leaves that each tea presents to you. And again, this goes right back to Gong Fu. We'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Here's some pictures of some scholars sitting in their tea rooms. What I want to show you here is that during the Ming period, and really upwards to the late Qing, scholars were not making their own tea. And instead, you had what we call cha uh, tong making tea. These are acolytes. These are young boys, usually, making tea. And we see one tucked in the corner. And he's tending the flame here. And he's the one who's going to be boiling the water, which is the sort of part of making tea. If you can boil the water correctly, then you can make tea. And if you can have good access to great water, then you can make great tea. So he's boiling water here. He might even be putting the leaves into the teapot, and then he's bringing that out to these gentlemen here, who are seated on either side of this Yixing teapot. It's probably one of those larger Ming teapots, if you want to sort of slice hairs. Here. Now, where does Gong Fu Cha culture, or tea culture, situate itself in China? Well, this will kind of give you a good idea. Um, what we see along here, this eastern seaboard, and then in this basin here, in, in around Sichuan, are tea growing regions in China, very, very famous tea growing regions in China. And it's in these areas that you have the development and beginnings of what we call Gong Fu Cha. These are people or communities where people are coming together and brewing tea in tea houses, in, in scholar studios, and they're brewing tea in a way that becomes regionally distinctive. They're using different materials to brew their tea. They're using, let's say, in Chengdu, all right, capital of Sichuan. In Chengdu, they typically use a gaiwan. And they have a very specific way of pouring water into that gaiwan. They typically will drink the tea directly from the gaiwan. This is all part of Chengdu Gong Fu Cha. The way you brew tea in a specific area now becomes the way that you can master the brewing of that tea. Moving to the eastern seaboard, we see even more diverse ways of brewing tea that emerge from places like Zhaoan, uh, as well as Anxi. All right, these are two areas in Fujian, um, and they're in sort of the thick of tea producing areas. So you have your Wu Yishan oolongs, you have your Anxi oolongs, um, and then further south, you have probably the most famous place where Gong Fu Cha has its beginnings, and that's in Chaozhou. And that's where you see the popularization of small teapots just like this. Uh, that's also where you see the popularization of using small teacups like this. And we'll go into that next. Uh, and then you also have areas where tea culture has begun to sort of bleed over to. And you have areas, let's say like Taiwan, that you'll also see Gong Fu Cha emerge. But it too is marked by its regional differences. And we'll talk about that as we jump into these specific tea regions and the teas that come out of those specific tea regions and how that's changed ever so slightly by those areas. Um, but this map could be expanded even all the way out to places like uh, Korea, to Japan. We wouldn't necessarily use the term Gong Fu Cha, but the approach to making tea would be informed in the same way that Gong Fu, the skill and challenge of brewing tea, would. So in places like Korea, where they have the daily tea ceremony, we'll just call it ceremony or method of making tea, they're looking at temperature, they're looking at leaf type, they're looking at vessel. It's the same with Japan and Senchado. They're looking at the leaf, they're looking at the temperature of the water, they're looking at the shape of the teapot, or the shape of the hobin or hohin. Um, and all of these come into uh, consideration 
when you're brewing that tea. So again, this is Gong Fu Cha. This Gong Fu Cha is out of China. All right. We could expand this map to be worldwide, and you'd get even a better sense of what I'm talking about. Just diving deep into one of the regions, and that's primarily what we're going to be focusing on tonight, is Chaozhou Gong Fu Cha. This is the form of tea that I was taught many, many years ago, uh, and have been practicing every day. Uh, Chaozhou Gong Fu Cha has with it uh, a focus on pretty much oolong teas. Um, Chaozhou itself is a producer of what we call Feng Huang Dan Tong. These are uh, Phoenix single bush or single origin or single tree oolongs. Uh, we'll brew some tonight, um, but the way that they get the flavors out of those teas is very distinct. And it really pushes the notion of Kung Fu to its very limit. And it's through better understanding this style of brewing tea that at least I came to an understanding of how to brew tea, what flavors there were in tea, how to utilize teapots, very similar to this, small Yixing teapots, uh, to unlock the myriad of flavors that we find in tea. Uh, and these are teas that were produced within that region and around that region, so around southeast China, technically northeast Guangdong province, where we find Chaozhou. And just to kind of give you a sense of the materiality of that tea culture, well, you have what's called the four treasures of Gong Fu Cha, the Chaozhou Gong Fu Cha. Uh, and we have here the Maple Creek clay kettle. Uh, it's being made out of a very specific clay that has very great heat properties, so you can boil water. Who knew that you need a specific clay to boil water in? Well, Chaozhou Gong Fu Cha. Uh, you also have your Roshan teapots, or the Roshan Pingming uh, Bay, which means the uh, Roshan, the artist Roshan. Pingming uh, Bay is the, uh, the tasting Ping. Ming, uh, which is the uh, poetic term for tea. It's an archaic term for tea, Ming. And then Bay, just meaning cup. Pingming Bay, these are little cups. This is a Ming period, uh, Roshan Ping Ming Bei, that I'm holding in my hand. So. And then next you have your Chaoyan clay stove. This is what we call a Ni Lu, just means clay stove. This thing right here. And then finally you have your Yi Xing Ji uh, Sha Hu. Um, and then you also have your Chaozhou Ji Sha Hu. Um, these are teapots that are made in the style of Yi Xing teapots these little clay pots, but they're using Chaozhou clay. But during the Ming, Qing, and modern period, uh, they use both Yixing clay and Chaozhou clay in uh, Chaozhou. They even go so far as to use even porcelain, but these are the famous uh, four, uh, uh, nice. These are the four famous, uh, or four treasures of Chaozhou Gong Fu Chao. And for those of you at home, for those of you in the tea house, this is a Chaozhou Gong Fu uh, teapot. Um, one of many different shapes and sizes that they come in, but this is one of the smaller ones. This is about 50 milliliters, maybe a little less. Um, and this is using uh, clay that has been hand spun, spun on a wheel. And that's a very distinctive way of producing a teapot uh, as opposed to a Yixing teapot, which is hand constructed with no wheel. We talked about that last time we met when we talked about all about Yixing and Chaozhou teapots. Go visit that if you want to learn more. We're moving on. <laughs> so why Gong Fu Cha? Why teapots? Why Gaiwan? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, since the beginning of the Ming period, the edict from the first Ming emperor to do away with cake teas that were ground up into powder and the promulgation of loose leaf teas meant that you needed a new way to brew tea. You couldn't just take tea leaves and throw them into a chawa and drink it. You couldn't even whisk those leaves. You had to find new ways to brew those teas. And one of the ways that they did that was by moving towards teapots, moving towards gaiwan, uh, moving towards brewing tea in cups, um, boiling tea, things like that. But what I want to draw out right now at this very moment is that this posed a challenge 
to tea drinkers throughout China. And it is that challenge that's at the core of brewing tea in Gong Fu Cha. If you're not challenged by the tea, if you're not acquiring a new skill, if you're not acquiring a new skill to brew that tea, then, well, you're just making tea with hot water. You're not doing it mindfully. And so for those of the, those of the folks who were connoisseurs of tea during this time period, well, they began to focus their way of brewing tea on how to do so and how to drop very, very specific flavors of teas that were now coming from all regions throughout China. During the Ming and Qing period, we have an explosion of different tea types. It's during these periods that you have the beginnings of oolong, you have the beginnings of bai cha, white tea, uh, huang cha begins to expand, poor even begins to expand, and hei cha even begins to expand. And boy howdy did they even begin to expand upon things like lu cha, green tea. Uh, it's during this time period that you have the beginnings of what we call the, the big famous teas of China. Teas that were recognized across the country as being quintessential to Chinese tea culture. And these are celebrated in the way of brewing tea quintessentially through Gong Fu Cha. So going back to how we brew tea, well, core to at least the way that we'll learn tonight is the use of tea pots. Now, why again do we want to choose tea pots like this? Well, they have a very specific type of clay that they're made of. This is an unglazed, yixing sourced clay. And it comes in many different colors, it comes in many different consistencies. Uh, it can be fired at high heat, it can be fired at low heat. And all of these different variations just in this regionally specific clay and how it's used to make teaware can produce different effects on the way that you brew tea. In the examples here, we have three different teapots. Um, one here is a low fired jima uh, duani. This is a sesame seed colored duani clay. So it's kind of yellow, kind of black, it's speckled. Um, we have here a high fire juni or cinnabar colored clay. This is a classic, famous clay of Yixing. Uh, it's, it's kind of harder to find these days, um, and it tends to be rarer and higher quality forms of this tea. Uh, this clay for teaware can fetch quite a high price for collectors, um, but it's also well, very, very well suited for brewing tea and absorbing tea's flavor. And then here we have a modern teapot made of Neizi uh, Wai Hong, Neizi uh, Wai Hong clay, and this is a blended clay. This is a purple Qing uh, uh, Shui. Uh, clay, it's kind of purple brown, and it's covered in hongmi, sort of yellow, sort of, forgive me, orange red clay, hongmi. Um, so, just looking at these, it, pre it presents three different challenges to the tea brewer. Um, just by looking at the clay itself and the firing, it gets even more complicated, not to make it even more complicated, but looking at the shape of the teapot we have to now consider how does this shape suit the tea that we're brewing. So as we jump into that question, let's just look at the parts of the teapot. This is kind of teapot 101. Uh, we have our little nodule on the top here, the uh, handle or the basho. Um, we have our jianggu, uh, which is the shoulder, which is the edge of the mouth or the opening of the teapot. We have, in some cases, the mu zhi zhua zhi, which is the uh, thumb catch of the sort of handle, other handle, of the teapot right here. This one doesn't have a thumb catch. I don't think I own a teapot with a thumb catch. Sorry, folks. Uh, and then we have the base. We have the abdomen, the sort of well of the teapot. We have the penko, the spray mouth. This is referring to the uh, little filter inside of the teapot. So we won't see it in this picture, but when you look inside the teapot, you'll see it. Uh, and then we have the hu zui, which is the uh, pot spout, sort of tip of the teapot spout. Uh, and then finally, the gaizu. 
It's the cover, same as in Gaiwan. This is the Gaizu of the uh, teapot. Looking even further, we get an even more complicated vision of what constitutes a teapot. And I won't go too deeply into this because we did this more in all about Yixing and Chaozhou teapots. But what I will say is that when you're a tea connoisseur, especially one who practices Gongfu Cha, you begin to look at a teapot shape differently. The teapot shape has to have certain components to it that ensure that the tea will brew correctly. And part of that is a better understanding of teapot harmonics. And when I talk about teapot harmonics, I talk about balances, points of reference within the teapot that will end up sort of matching or lining up or leading up to. And this is geared towards not just the construction of the teapot itself, so it looks nice, but also so it brews tea very well. And why do you want to have a teapot that brews very well? Well, if you're a Gong Fu Cha tea person, a practitioner of Gong Fu Cha, all of a sudden, what the teapot looks like is going to have to be uh, form before function, in a way. And so you have teapots that might look very, very simple. There's no artifice here. There aren't any sort of, you know, pretty pictures on here. This isn't in the shape of like a wash hole or, a, you know, a citrus. It's not in the shape of, you know, a, a dragon. You know, there aren't any crazy shapes here. And instead, they're focusing on a pure shape. Even though it looks like a pear, it's very pared down. I don't mean to make that as a silly pun. But what we see here is very, very basically an opening, the, what we call shoulder of the teapot, lining up with the penko, with the spout here. And there's a reason why they do that. So water doesn't pour out or pour slowly out of the teapot. The opening here where the guides of and shoulder meet, have to meet very, very flush. Have to meet in a way that no air and no water can pass through. Why do you do that? Well, we'll show you. But one of the reasons is, is that it allows for a very swift brew and a very swift pour, very even pour, from the spout, from the teapot. Other things, such as the handle of the teapot, have to be balanced. And the reason why you want that is so you can pour evenly. And so you can pour without feeling like the teapot's gonna fall out of your hand. So again, it reinforces the idea of this teapot wants to make the brewing of tea feel second nature. So we can talk about this for days. I'm not going to. Now finally, before we jump into how to brew with a teapot, I just wanna jump sort of lightly into why we choose different teapot shapes. And the first reason is, is because, well, the shape should fit the need of the tea. When you select the teapot, don't look at the teapot. Look at the tea. Or if you're going to look at the teapot, imagine what tea fits that teapot best. So we have, I'll just use an example. This is a fangu just means antique shaped teapot. It's referring to an ancient shape sort of vessel that this is kind of emulating. It's a squat teapot. It has a very large opening for the size of the teapot. It's quite small, it's quite stout, and well, the walls are quite thick. If I ask the question, what tea would best suit this teapot? I could give you an answer. And that answer comes from years and years of brewing tea. We'll brew that tea tonight in this teapot, but I'll give away that answer right now. I use this teapot and have been using this teapot for almost 20 years now to brew yam cha, we dark oolongs. Why do I do that? Well, the tea leaves themselves are quite small and wiry. And for that reason, we are uh, able to brew this tea even. We'll go deeper into why specifically we use certain teapots uh, as we start brewing tea, but just to give you a sense. Um, each one of these teapots shown here, each one of the teapots that we have here below on the tea table has been paired to a specific type of tea and will help to brew that tea optimally 
as you brew the tea year after year. Before you brew tea, you must place tea into the tea pot. And so these are a couple of ways you can do it. One, the most easy, easiest way is just by using one of these tea scoops and pouring the tea dry leaves into the teapot. Just want to make sure that as you do that, make sure that the leaves enter evenly, don't have them push to one side, don't have them fall to the very bottom and sort of spread out. Instead, you want to have the leaf kind of fluff up inside of the teapot. And as you pour water over, pour completely over the tea. This helps the evenness of brewing from that teapot. If you really want to go off the deep end, do what I do. Um, I was taught this by a tea teacher of mine. Uh, this is something that would have been done by one of those cha tong uh, during the Ming Dynasty. This is where you can actually lay out every tea leaf here and put them in one after the next into the teapot. The reason why you would want to do this is because now you can control exactly where that tea leaf is and exactly where that water will land on those tea leaves. Uh, doing this results in a very, very even, very, very complex, very, very nuanced and controlled cup of tea. Uh, I was using a Da uh, Hung Pao, big red robe from Wei uh, in this teapot. The Da Hung Pao that I was using was one that had come from one of the clones of one of the original Da Hong Pao pots. It was the best cup of Da Hong Pao that I'd ever had. And the way that I ensured that was by starting off brewing just like this. Next, in terms of how you pour the water into the teapot, we'll go over this tonight as well, but how you would go about doing that is by starting on the outside and pouring inward. And as you pour inward, pull the spout of the kettle upwards. The reason why you do that is that it helps to move the tea leaves around inside of the teapot. We'll talk about this a little bit more as we do that time. And then finally, pour water over the entirety of the teapot, and that helps to ensure that the teapot and the tea within remain super hot. This is something that you do in Chao Zhou Kung Fu Cha, and we'll talk about this a little bit more as we start brewing tea. So clues and cues into how to brew the tea and know when the tea is ready to be decanted into teacups. Look for this little meniscus bubble. This meniscus bubble will start off sort of bulging out of the penko, the, the tea spout, or the teapot spout, and it will then begin to recede into the spout. And this refers to the moment that the tea leaves inside of the tea inside of the teapot begin to expand and absorb the flavor of the tea, or absorb the water, forgive me, and then expel the flavor from the leaves, the tea leaves. Uh, it's when that begins to fully pull down into the spout that you know that those leaves have begun to move, they've begun to open up, and that's when that first steeping at least should be pulled out. Why is this important? Why do we look at minutia such as this? Well, teapots tend to be opaque. You can't see into them. They're a black box. It's for this reason that you have to look at the subtle cues outside of that teapot to know what's going on inside. In Gong Fu Cha, even the teapot is a challenge to making tea. Overcoming that challenge through learning the little tips, the little insights into that material object that you're using to brew that tea leaf is going to give you a greater insight on how to brew that tea. This just being one of them. Folding teapots is also a consideration. There are three classical ways of doing this. There are certainly more than three, but these are three that I typically use. One is called the Phoenix Hand. We'll show you how to do that tonight. That's by just gripping the handle of the teapot, putting your finger, index finger, on the little button of the tea, not covering the hole on the top, not the carburetor, and then pouring. It's a very steady way, very easy way of pouring tea, but it takes practice. Next is uh, just looping a finger through the handle and pressing one's thumb onto the little button on the teapot. I'm going to do it here. It's not really meant for this teapot, but that's an approximation of that. 
And then finally, one of my favorites is just by looping your middle finger through the, uh, through the handle of the teapot. This doesn't work with every teapot, um, but that allows you to cradle the teapot in the hand. And this method was derived specifically for something like this seashore, this uh, sort of concubine-shaped uh, teapot. And why we do that? Well, it's very easy to drink directly from the spout of this teapot, um, which is in itself another way of brewing tea. You have to understand and master how to control that. So this gives you one way to do it. Finally, other considerations for brewing gong fu cha. Um, I usually keep the, the lid of the teapot off the teapot. Um, we'll talk about why we do that, but imagine a teapot being a crucible, very similar to the Song period tea bowl. This is where the brewing of the tea occurs. And heat, moisture, these are things that you want to have full control over. So by lifting the lid off the teapot and putting it to the side enables you to reduce the heat and allows for moisture to sort of evaporate out of the teapot in between steepings. So once you're done brewing your tea, you usually let the top off the teapot to enable the leaves to kind of air out. Some people don't like to do this. I personally do like to do this. The result of doing this means that the flavor of the tea tends to be a little bit more complex when you go back to it because you're not really overbrewing that tea at that point. And then finally, 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 last slide, I promise. We use teapots with various different filters in them. This is just kind of the natural progression of the development of teapots through the ages. During the Ming and during the Qing and during the early parts of the 20th century, teapots usually had just one hole. Why was that? Well, the shape of the teapot and the use of the teapot originated from being a ewer. If you remember back to when we were talking about the Song period, teapots had a shape that originated from these wine or hot water ewers. Um, and so they kept that same form, that, that single hole uh, that would lead from the bottom of the spout all the way to the, the uh, pouring end of the spout. Um, and nothing changed for that. There wasn't really a need for that change. People just adapted their style and modified their style to the, the brewing of tea. And if tea leaves got stuck in that hole, well, you know, you shake the teapot a little bit and you continue pouring. It's not the best filter, but a lot of people do love it because one, it's historically very authentic. And then two, it is a very strong pour. So if you can manage to get the leaves away from the single hole, then you can successfully pour that tea. Um, during the 20th century and in parts of the late Qing, they start putting multiple holes in the teapots and these are different sort of arrangements for that. And then in the latter part of the 20th century, starting in the late 80s, early 90s, they start putting in this weird golf ball filter. It's sort of this projected filter that goes into the teapot, oftentimes made of clay. The reason why they did that is so it could, you know, keep fine particles of tea out of the final liqueur. Um, but all of these, too, present their own challenges. Overcoming that challenge is, again, part of Gong Fu Cha. So, that concludes tonight's at least slide presentation. Without further ado, I want to jump directly into dive, I might say. Dive directly into the brewing of tea tonight, which is all, which is why we're all here, and which is a continuation of why we call this all about Gong Fu Cha. So, without further ado, still see is it yeah. my allegedly burning tea still <laughs> all right so we're gonna shift a little bit throwing out the modern technology sort of we'll start boiling some more oh yes front Finally. all right all right folks it's been a while 
let's brew some tea. So tonight we're going to be brewing at least four different teas, if not more, we'll see. All of these teas tonight, maybe with the exception of one, will be oolongs. Why oolongs? Well, when we talk about Gong Fu Cha, much of that history of Gong Fu Cha circulates and sort of revolves around communities in China, regions in China, that produce Yes Folks Oolong Tea. Uh, when we talk about Chaozhou Gong Fu Cha specifically, it's a style that emerged from Chaozhou, and this is a region in southern China, southeast China, northeast Guangdong province, and this is an area that rubs right up against Fujian. So not only are they producing their own teas, these are Chaozhou Feng Huan Danzong, these are Phoenix Oolongs, um, but they're also producing teas, or they're also bringing in teas from Fujian. And these are some of the famous teas of China as well. These are, uh, 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 what? Oh. <laughs> these are Wu Yi Yan Cha, all right? So like your Da Hong Pao, your Shui Jingwei, your uh, uh, Lo Han. These are long, wiry leaf teas, but you're also bringing in, into Chaozhou, teas like uh, uh, Jie Guanyin, and this is from Anxi. These are both Fujian teas, but they're coming into Chaozhou, and they're being brewed in this style. So I'm going to go over Chaozhou Gong Fu Cha a lot tonight, partially because that's a style of tea that I was well-trained in, um, but it's also a great sort of launch point for those of you who really want to explore what Gong Fu Cha is. Um, they use the sort of nuts and bolts of how to better understand tea from both understanding temperature, time, but also use of vessels, specifically these Yixing teapots. So we'll start with that tonight. First, before anything, we're gonna bring our kettle to a boil. Tonight we're using an electronic kettle when I'm at home, I typically do away with my electronic wares and tend to use charcoal, um, tend to use live fire. Why do I do that? Well, it slows the pace of tea down, um, but since we're in a New York building, uh, I really don't want to burn down this tea house. Um, we want to preserve tea culture, and this is uh, just one way that we do it. So, yes. Elena likes that. Um, before I start, I just want to show you in proper Chaozhou Gong Fu Cha manner, I'm using three cups. I don't know if you can see that or not. I'm probably going to drop them. Um, three cups are a great amount, um, not only because three is a very strong number in Chinese numerology. Good things happen in three. Three refers to uh, uh, humanity. Uh, it refers to earth, it refers to heaven, so the big three. Um, but it also refers to the strength of three, three being the sort of number for a tripod or ding. And this is something that cannot be knocked down. If, if it's on three legs, like the tripod that's holding up this iPhone tonight, it's very hard to tip over. Um, and so the number three represents that strength. Um, additionally, too, Three cups is really all you need to brew for tea. I'm going to start brewing tea tonight using this teapot. We're going to brew some tie guan yin, uh, traditionally roasted tie guan yin. And as you'll see, this teapot really only holds enough liquid for just three, tea, uh, three cups of tea. So, I think I'm boiling water. I don't know if I need it. <laughs> start off just by showing off these tea leaves. This tea was procured from a local tea house. I'm trying to remember specifically their address. Um, if you are curious to find it, they're in an antique store. Their name is Jin Yun Fu. Jin Yun Fu. I think Jin is gold or silver. Yun is cloud. The Fu, I believe, might be Fu of uh, good luck, but they didn't put the Chinese characters on here, so I'll find out later. Um, this is an excellent 
roasted Tianguanian. And in the spirit of sharing, I want you guys to know about this. Um, I enjoy it, and if you want to find it, go there. Um, if you want other excellent Tianguanian, um, we're going to be bringing in some beautiful Tianguanian from uh, Anxi uh, later this year uh, here at Floating Mountain Tea House in uh, Manhattan's Upper West Side. So check out later this year, you will find that tea. Um, but in the meantime, go to this tea shop, find this tea. So I can hear this kettle, it's beginning to boil. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I'm at home brewing tea and boiling water, um, usually over the fire, is I like to not listen necessarily because it's kind of hard to listen. This is an electric kettle that makes a lot of humming sounds. But what I look for before the water begins to boil is a little thread of steam will begin to rise from the spout of this teapot. And classically, even going as far back as the Lu Yu during the what was it, 8th century, during the Tang period, he talks about this. He talks about this little thread of, uh, of steam that goes up. He says it's like twisted silk. Um, and when we begin to see that, we know that we're reaching that first point of oil. If this was a glass teapot, or, or forgive me, kettle, tea kettle, you begin to see small little beads of, of air affixing to the side of this kettle. And those little sort of pearls that adhere to the side showcase that first, that, that beginning stage of a boil. As they begin to rise, they rise slowly and they're quite small and they liberate themselves from the side of that kettle. Um, that is when the tea or the, the, the water for tea is reaching about, let's say, 85, 87 degrees Celsius. Um, as they begin to rise even more and roll up, getting larger and larger from crab's eyes to fish eyes, from shrimp eyes to crab eyes to fish eyes. Did I say that right? Shrimp, crab, fish. Um, this is, these are larger bubbles that begin to rise, so they're quite small, they get larger and larger, and then they begin to roil, almost like a sort of turbulence in a rolling stream. Um, these are all poetic terms that we use for describing water as it begins to boil. And for people who practice Kung Fu Cha, knowing your different levels of boil is key to understanding how hot that water is. Um, it's also key if you're in the pre-modern world, or let's say you don't have access to good water. Let's say you know, you're pulling this from a river, and you don't know if it's the greatest water. You do need to boil that water. That is key to having fresh water. So in ancient China, they knew this sort of. They didn't have germ theory, but they knew that if you boiled water, it would be safe to drink, all right? By adding tea to it, not only was it safe to drink, but at this point, you'd be getting the nutrients from the tea, you'd be getting the vitamins, you'd be getting the energizing properties from tea. And that is why tea from very, very early on is this sort of magical thing. It's this thing that you can drink and you get more energy, you wake up. Um, but even that goes into the boiling of this tea, knowing how hot that water is. Partially because, in very much big part, because you don't want to get sick from the water that you're using to brew that tea. So we might think of it as like, well, I want to brew a green tea, so I'll use this temperature. Well, they didn't have that sort of uh, luxury, let's call it that, back then. They knew that if you boiled water, however, whatever tea you chose to brew, whether it's green tea, white tea, yellow tea, oolong, red tea, hong cha, poor, hei cha, black tea, if it was any of those teas, once you boiled that water, you were well on your way to brewing that tea. In the case of Chaozhou Kung Fu Cha, we typically brew every tea at boiling. And I know that sounds crazy, but that is kind of at the core of this form of Kung Fu Cha. That too is a challenge. And how we face that challenge, how we you know, resolve that challenge and the skill that we have to brew that tea 
when we are faced with that challenge is part of, in this case, Chaoju Kung Fu training. So first off, what I've done, what you've seen me do here, is I've opened the teapot. And now I'm gonna pour some water into the teapot. We're doing this to warm the teapot. I didn't put all of the water from that tea kettle into the teapot, nor did I fill this teapot. Instead, I just put a little bit of water, and now I'm rolling it around in my hand. It's rolling, it's rolling. What I'm doing here is I'm heating up this teapot, and it's really hot. I'm burning my hand every time I touch this teapot. The way I'm holding this teapot, this is the sort of phoenix hand way of holding a teapot. The reason why I'm doing that is because when you hold a teapot like this, I'm not actually touching where the hot part of that teapot is. Instead, I'm touching the little button, or in this case, the little lanyard that comes off. And I'm holding just the handle, I'm not actually touching anything that's warm about this teapot. It's from this that I then pour the water into the cups. Pour, 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 pour. Now my teapot is warm, and now my cups are warm. I'm going to do one last thing. There's water in the teacups. I'm going to roll this, roll this, roll this. I don't know if you're actually going to see this, so I'll do this once in front of the camera. And Chao Zhou, they do a specific thing to warm the teacups. They, they have water in the teacup, and then they dip the teacup into the other teacup and warm both teacups and wash the teacups at the same time. And they do that to every teacup. I'm not that good at this. I don't oftentimes do this. But I'm doing this for you guys. You do that to every teacup. So that means even the last teacup Pour that liquid into the first teacup. So all teacups get washed. And all teacups get warmed. And then finally, you take those, that, that last teacup filled with hot water. This is boiling water. I was burning my hands just there, just for you guys. Pour that over the teapot. And that helps to warm the exterior of that teapot. That's something that you'll see us doing time and time again. Slightly closer. So everybody, even in the internet land, can see. So now our teapot's warm. All right. Now what do we do? Well, we've got this tea. We'll show you again. This is our traditionally roasted tea guan yin. It's from Anxi Province or Anxi County, for to be in Fujian Province. Uh, they're tightly rolled, though they're not super tightly rolled. They're hand rolled. You can tell because they're kind of like loose. They're not quite the big, big pellets that you see with Taiwanese tea. We'll look at some tonight. Nor are they those super tight, super green, sort of cabbage-colored tea leaves of uh, modern tea guanyin. I don't like those. I'm sorry. You'll hear me talk about this a lot. Instead, they're loosely rolled and they're firing using charcoal. And it's a slow firing process, one that meticulously layers flavor upon flavor, um, fruit notes, uh, charcoal notes, uh, sort of toasted and biscuity notes, uh, caramelized and baked apple notes. All of those you'll find within this tea. And that's what we're gonna try to bring out tonight as we pour boiling water over these tea leaves. So I'm gonna put the tea leaves into the teapot. The way I'm gonna do that, I'll show you kind of on the side here. The way you wanna do that is by first putting some tea leaves towards the center. And then as you heat them on, note what direction they go. What you wanna do is produce a mound of tea inside of that teapot that is pretty even in shape on all sides. It's similar, for those of you who practice Japanese tea ceremony, chanoyu, uh, if you've laid 
matcha powder into a, uh, a natsume, sort of lacquer tea container, you'll note how evenly and what shape that mound of tea, that mound of powdered matcha is in that natsume. It's similar to this. The reason why we do it for here, though, is that we want to have full and even access of that hot water over those tea leaves. So what I'm doing now is I just took the water off the oil. I can let it sit in my hand ever so slightly for just a, a swift moment. The reason why I might do that is to help cool the water down ever so slightly. I'm noting how long I'm waiting for that, and then I'm going to very, very quickly pour water lightly over those leaves. This is going to be for a rinse. Now the way that I pour the water over that tea is probably the most important thing I want you guys to, guys and girls, to learn tonight. And that is, as the water goes into the teapot, it's doing a spiral. Remember that diagram from that presentation I just gave? It's a clockwise spiral that then makes its way from the outside to the center. And as it makes its way from the outside to the center, I pull the spout of the tea kettle up, and that helps to kind of move the tea leaves around a bit. Now, now that my leaves are fully wetted, now that I poured that first rinse into this teacup, we're gonna smell the tea. Smell the tea. Baked apple, yes. We're, we're smelling baked apple in this. A nice kind of slight spicy note to it. There's cinnamon is there, yep. Um, this is sort of characteristic of this style of Tiabonian. There's no kind of plantiness, there's no really floral note, maybe like a marigold at most. At the very most, or sort of like a. It's a floral, it's a dark. It's a, yeah. Yeah. Um, some people say there's also sort of like a toasted sunflower seed kind of note. Um, so that's going to come out from this. And smelling the tea like that is a good way to kind of prepare yourself for what you might be looking for in that final steeping or, you know, subsequent steeping that we'll do. Um, it's also a good way to know, is this tea going to want to have a long steeping or a shorter steeping? Will it need really high heat to get those flavors, or will it be low and slow? And this is something that you'll want to note, especially with roasted tiabonian, because that roasted note will always be there. It's not disappearing. So how do you make sure that that roasted flavor, in this case that sort of charcoal note, doesn't sort of overshadow those bright, light notes of tea. That, that cinnamon, that baked apple, that uh, sometimes you'll find like a apricot note, things like that. How do you make sure that that doesn't disappear? Um, one of the ways that you can do that, super hot, is by modulating the time of the steeping. And we're not using a clock here. We're not using any sort of timing device. What we're using instead is the one that we talked about earlier, and that is first pouring water over the teapot and watching that dissipate, and then secondly, watching for a little meniscus bubble to pull down. Now that meniscus bubble has, I'm not sure it's started going down. I'm gonna throw a little bit more water on top of this just to cheat, I'm so sorry. But I'm doing that push water into the teapot from the carb up through the spout. And now we have that meniscus bubble and now it's going straight down into the teapot. Pour the old tea over this teapot, it's going to get super hot. And at this point I'm going to pour the tea out. This tea is pretty much ready to go. If I want to have more body for this tea, I'll let it sit a little bit longer. But because it has been, you know, roasted at a higher point, then let's say a more modern Tia Guan Yin will want to kind of pull back. Modern Tia Guan Yin or even this uh, Brue Taiwanese Oolong 
you're going to want to want to let it sit for a little bit longer. Now, as I pour the tea into the tea cups, it's straight in. If I tilt the teapot ever so slightly, like if I pour like this, that'll slow down the speed of the water coming out of the teapot. So if you notice with this first cup, as you're pouring into the teapot, I mean into the teacup, from the teapot, you notice it being very light. And you're pouring like this, pull back, all right? It's kind of like decelerating the call. Pull back, it'll slow down because, you know, now the water is going from this rather than straight down, and that'll produce a slower brewed tea and result in a, a longer brew, a longer steeping, and a darker uh, color in the cup. And finally, uh, a, a stronger cup of tea. So, and this tea. Tasting tea is not to hua cha, not to drink tea, but to pin cha. And pin, meaning taste, is comprised of three characters. Again, that number three. It's, it's comprised of three mouth radicals. And that mouth radical for pin can also refer to the three ways that we consume the tea. And that is first, we look at the tea's color. All right? Notice the, the color of the liquor. Then we enjoy the tea's aroma. What flavors do you get just by smelling the tea? And then finally, we sip the tea. In this case, you want to slurp the tea. Atomize the tea over the soft palate. From that, you'll get a better understanding of how the tea tastes. Um, I think we were successful in bringing out most of those flavors. Um, you will know if you've gone over the limit of this tea, uh, if it becomes bitter or if it becomes sour. But note that, especially with chao zhou gong fu cha, when you brew this tea, you are pushing it to its extreme. As one of my tea teachers said, it's like, running to the edge of a cliff and stopping as your feet and your toes kind of curl over the edge. You can see everything on the horizon over that cliff, even the bottom. And it's analogous to seeing every flavor in this tea. It exposes everything to you. So you push this tea to the limit and you will be able to taste everything that tea has. one more time and we'll go through a Taiwanese oolong. We'll do kind of comparison and then we'll jump into some other, again, oolong teas, but just two more. That's all we have time for. Um, so we brew this one more time. Typically you can brew these teas upwards to seven, eight, nine, sometimes 10, 12 steepings. When you're brewing it in the chaozhou method though, you typically Get fewer steepings. Why? Well, because you're using really high heat. And then two, you're doing a longer steeping than what you would normally do with kind of modern gong fu cha, where lower temperatures are used, lighter steepings typically are used too. So in this second steeping, we're still seeing that meniscus bubble that's rising and it's going to begin to fall. The water is fully dissipated off of the tea pump. 
so you know it's really, really hot water. And now that meniscus is beginning to fall. And at this point, I'm gonna ask the question again, how long do I wait for this? And as being a sort of well-schooled tea practitioner, and specifically with this teapot, this teapot has been brewing traditionally roasted tea, I won yet for over 10 years now, if not longer. This teapot will actually begin to slightly change color. And when we say slightly change color, we mean something from a cinnabar red to something more like almost a dark, almost brick red, or a, I don't know, it's hard to say, a sort of almost like blood red, I hate to say that, or a beefsteak tomato for the vegans in the crowd. Um, it gets really, really, really dark. Um, and it begins to look a little shinier too. Those are the tea oils beginning to kind of glisten. Um, and that means that this tea is now ready to decant. It doesn't take that long. Again, I'm tilting the teapot ever so slightly just to modulate how much time it sits in that teapot. Slowing down the steeping ever so slightly and then speeding up towards the end. These are some tricks. And again, I lift the lid off the teapot so it allows for the tea to breathe. And it fit three teacups perfectly. And again, what we're showing here is Chaozhou Gongfu Cha. If we were doing this in Zhaoan, we might use a piece of paper instead of this tea scoop. Um, we might be lining up the teacups. Uh, if this was in Taiwan, we might be doing a, uh, a dry stone or dry plate, the sort of, uh, what do we call that? Uh, gan pan, sometimes gan shi. Um, the dry plate or dry stone tea brewing method where we don't pour water over this, where we try to keep everything as dry as possible. Um, other areas produce different ways of brewing tea again. Chaozhou being famous, they like to use gaiwan instead of teapots. Um, and they use, you know, very interesting, beautiful uh, pouring methods, sometimes using very beautiful and, and very elaborate uh, sort of tea dance, uh, where they have a, a tea kettle with a spout that's sometimes uh, a meter, if not longer, um, and that's to shoot the water into the gaiwan. So we're not doing that tonight. If you ever wanted to, we can definitely set that up, but what we're focusing on tonight right now is how we brew this very basic approach to chao Do you know how to do this? No. The, the gong fu cha of, of Chengdu? No, I do not. I want to. When I go to San Francisco, in a couple of days, there's somebody there who practices this. You might try to see this person. If I'm crazy, I'll try to see this person. Hmm. One thing I did not mention the first time we were sipping tea is in every teacup, you have the final aroma. Some people call this the lang xiang, the sort of cold aroma or cold fragrance of the teacup, and it produces a very beautiful scent, the lingering flavor of tea inside of the teacup. And it's very different from what you'd smell from the teapot to when the teacup is full of tea. Very, very different flavors. Explore that. That too will teach you qualities of this tea, and what flavors you can unlock. So, and then finally, you know, we'll experience this a little bit more with our next tea. Um, we'll save that for our next tea. Yes. So, moving right along, we're going to put this teapot aside. We're going to use that tonight. Not here, though. I'm going to get back home. I'm going to reset the tea station. That involves just 
pouring water out of the uh, cha pan. Now I'm going to pick up this teapot. I've shown this teapot throughout the presentation tonight, but now we're going to brew from it. This is what we call a si shu. That means uh, sort of what Lady of the West teapot. Lady of the West refers specifically to a concubine or a courtesan of the, um, what was it, the Ye Dynasty or Ye Kingdom. Um, and she was known for you know, looking a certain way, being quite beautiful, being slightly curvaceous. And this is a teapot that is modeled after her. Uh, this one is being made out of yumi, which is green clay, uh, and I've chosen to brew Taiwanese oolongs from this, in particular Taiwanese high mountain oolongs, um, almost always from the mountain of Sanlinchi, uh, uh, which is one of the tallest or one of the highest mountains in Taiwan. The tea that we're going to brew tonight is one that was gifted to me by uh, Stefan Erler of Tea Masters blog. He's been blogging since the late 90s, early 2000s. And he's been sourcing tea from Taiwan, and he's been living in Taiwan uh, for all that time. And the tea that he brings is quite excellent. Um, so tonight we're going to be brewing one of his teas. It's a little sample that he gave me. Um, and this is coming from Nishan, which is hands down one of the best areas to find tea on Taiwan. Um, and was picked, let me see, 2200 meters above sea level. So this is definitely a high mountain. The teapot has thick walls, which I'm going to warm up. With a wash of the teapot, which I'm doing right now. Warming up and cleaning the teacups since we're resetting them. Not going to go through all of that little dance that we did before. We're just going to pour one set of liquid into the next cup and then pour that over the teapot. Very simply, I'm going to take these tea leaves, and I don't know if you saw them, bring them closer. Very, very green, very, very large leaves from this Nishan. Pouring that into this teapot. Rinsing them lightly. This teapot, as you might see as I'm brewing it, is this is a single hole teapot. So at some point, the hole might get plugged. And that's one of, again, one of the many challenges of using this teapot. Um, I might even have to, uh, at some point, get a little tea needle. This is a little wooden or sometimes metal, I prefer the wooden, uh, device that we use to. Uh, dislodge tea leaf from that single hole. I can even see one right now is already in there. But I'm going to try to, without using an extra device, with using less, I'm going to try to dislodge that tea leaf. Let's see if we can do that. So I'm going to pour water over the tea. And first brew. And then I'm going to put the top on. But as I put the top on, I'm going to put it down and then pull it up. And that process will hopefully push that tea leaf either out or suck it into the teapot. Now, if that didn't work, what we can do next is take the teapot, pick up the teapot, and then as the teapot is brewing, I'm kind of, yeah, I'm kind of touching the uh, spout of it right now just to see how hot it is and it is quite hot. What we can do 
is swirl this around in our hand. Some will even go so far as to do this. If you go to some parts of China, Chaozhou being one of them, you'll see people do this. One of the reasons why you do that is that it moves the liquid around in that teapot and that enables the teapot to, or the liquid inside of that teapot to move and thus dislodge any leaves that might be on the teapot, or might be in the teapot spout. Because in this case we have a single, single whole teapot. And it seems to have worked a little bit. This is, again, a single whole teapot. Now if you get any little bits of tea leaves in, final tea liqueur, it's okay. If you don't want that, there are ways of pouring from the teapot that will keep those little bits of tea in the teapot. You don't need a filter. You don't even need a mesh filter, as some people use. I don't like mesh filters. If they're cloth, you'll taste the cloth. If they're metal, you'll taste the metal. If they're paper, you'll taste the paper. All of these have a residual flavor. Clay, on the other hand, will just pick up the flavor of tea. Glass will carry no flavor. Porcelain should carry no flavor. Keeping the lid tucked to the side so heat can escape from the teapot. This tea the core is a beautiful, sort of bright green. It's one of my favorite teas from Taiwan, the Nishan. I got addicted to this tea when I was a kid. My very first teapot was dedicated to Nishan. I didn't bring it today, but it was dedicated to Nishan. And uh, hopefully we'll get sense one. Again, we're admiring the color and now the aroma. It's like a fresh peach or lava. Like some exotic fruit. Some exotic some fruit. fruit. Mango steam, yeah. I don't know. Lychee. Lychee. Rambutan. Incredibly thick mouthfeel. Very, very creamy. Has a sort of... Um, when we, when we talk about milk tea. Yeah, it's always you know, like the green tea, so the yes. quality green tea. It's, it's actually very much like a very high quality uh, sencha or gyokuro. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why it's like that too. So when we talk about Taiwanese tea, we're talking not only about Taiwanese tea and the terroir of Taiwan, which is typically, you know, you have richer soil in Taiwan than what you have in other tea producing regions in long producing regions of China. But when we talk about why it tastes so, so much like a Japanese tea, well, let's look at the history of Taiwan too. This was an area that was occupied by the Japanese for quite a long period of time, from the 1870s to the you know, end of World War II. Um, the demand for tea that tasted like Japanese green tea, very bright green, verdant, very complex, but also very creamy, very um, almost uh, vegetal, um, but with interesting sort of tropical fruit notes. These are things that play very well to a Japanese market. And this carried well into you know, the end of the 20th century, and even to this day. And that's what we see when we drink a cup of Taiwanese green oolong, high mountain oolong. That's where we're getting that flavor. It's, it's tailored to that market. And that's the other thing. The, the snake that turns back and starts eating its own tail in this history is that when you have this tea, which is a tightly rolled oolong, green oolong, when you have that style get popular, all of a sudden, starting in the really the 90s, um, you see a little bit of this in the 80s, but really in the 90s and 2000s, Chinese green oolongs from Anxi province, right across the water from Taiwan and Fujian, they started making a lot of their tie guanyin in a style of this tea, which 
which is bright green, vegetal, floral, um, low oxidation, you know, maybe just hitting 30% at most and not really receiving any high firing at all. That's what they're trying to mimic, is this high mountain Taiwanese oolong. And that is the sort of modern style of Tiaguanian. So. Now, what tea do I favor? This is where, you know, I butt heads with modern tea affectionados. And I love teas when they try to be themselves. This tea, this Li Shan, is unabashedly trying to be itself, even though the flavor might taste like Gyokuro or Sencha, and there might be a history of that. That is part of this tea's history. It's part of this tea's origin. It grew up in that soil, literally, and in that production style. Um, this tea, this traditionally roasted and oxidized Tia Guanyin, I love. Uh, it's not my favorite traditionally roasted and oxidized tea guanyin. I, I rarely find that. But what we see in this is a tea that is preserving a style and preserving a flavor that's been around at least for, you know, 50 years, maybe 100 years. I've had very, very old tea guanyin, and they taste similar to that. Um, and it's a style that is quintessential of that area. It's not trying to be a Wu Shan Oolong, it's not trying to be a Chaozhou Oolong, nor is it trying to be a Taiwanese Oolong, it's trying to be a Tia Guan Yin. Um, so it, it makes me happy to see that there are people who are focusing their craft on that. That is also Wu Fu Cha. That's them looking at that tea and knowing that that flavor profile is in that tea and that they can, with the help of slow roast, that can take several days, um, with the right picking, with the right leaf type, with the, look, the right oxidation, all of these combined can produce a tea that will taste, in the end, like what we're tasting right now. So, yeah, yeah. When we talk about the sort of where Gong Fu begins, we talked about it historically where that begins, but when we talk about the sort of practice and action of Kung Fu, it starts at the very beginning of when tea is grown. Where you're growing the tea, how you're growing the tea, how you're picking the tea, how you're roasting the tea, so on and so forth. Even before we brew the tea, there is so much Kung Fu, skill, mastery, whatever you want to call it, um, that's gone into that leaf of tea before it becomes a cup of tea that we have to acknowledge that too. You can't just tack that on. I'm not a tea master. This is just me enjoying a tea master's tea. So we're brew this one more time. Again, this can brew a lot more than that one time, a lot more than two times. Brew probably seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve times, maybe more. I'll brew this a little bit longer. I really, really like to push Li Shan. Um, the intense mouthfeel that you get with it will start to come out. Um, really, really intense florals will present themselves. Um, and you don't have that roast that if you push it, that roast will end up kind of overpowering everything. And instead what you'll get is a very, very complex and layered uh, cup of tea. Like the teapot before, this one does darken. It started off kind of this olive green, and now it's almost a blue green. Yeah. yeah. Though this is not uh, what we would call uh, uh, blue. It's not blue clay. There is blue clay. It's blue clay that looks like uh, the blue is almost like a blueberry blue. You know, um, there's a lot of fake lime as well. So, yeah, it's like, oh, chemical. We can get that same color. So, now this teapot was probably made in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, there's a good chance that it was. So, that little meniscus has once again begun to pull back into the teapot. 
Um, again, this is a teapot that if I was sitting here alone, I could easily pick up and drink from. How is it hot to drink from the teapot? How is it? Not hot. How is it not hot? It's quite hot. It's and that's very why, hot. Yeah, most of the time you're sipping on the tea, so, so you're slurping it. So when I'm brewing this and drinking from it with my hand, out of my hand, like this, I'm not using boiling water. I'm using this almost as if I'm using a teacup, and I'm sipping from it as if I'm sipping from a teacup. And with that in mind, again, this is gold food, it's a good question. With that in mind, I'll let the water cool down. I'll, I'll not use just fresh off of boiling water. I'll use, it's very casual actually, it's me just sitting with a kettle off the boil, letting the water temperature go down, adding that to the pot, and then when it's not hot enough to touch, right? So temperature is down at that point, I hold the teapot and I drink directly from it. So it's gonna be a different brew. Yeah. It's very different. Any tea. way that you approach a teapot or any tea brewing vessel, whether it's a mason jar, whether it's a you know coffee mug, a thermos, a Dixie cup, you're gonna change the way you brew it and it will call for something. And you need to figure out what it's asking you to do. Um, if it is something that can retain high heat, but you are going to hold on to it, you don't want to put something in there that's, you know, boiling, boiling water. Instead, you want something that's been boiled, allowed to sit off, and be hot enough that you can already drink it. So, you know, somewhere around 85 uh, degrees centigrade. Less. Maybe less, yeah. And the brew time, therefore, will increase. You know, where we're brewing this for like two to three minutes, which is already a long time to brew tea. Um, you're going to let that brew sometimes five, sometimes six minutes. What you'll also notice is as you're holding the teapot, the pot's still really hot. I'm do that. As it's sitting in your hand, it's still brewing. As you're drinking from it, it's still brewing. So these are things that you have to take into consideration as well. Sitting in your stomach. <laughs> For chance. <laughs> Do we have questions? I looked at our question on uh, Questions, questions. You? Li Shan. Li Shan. So even now that we've brewed this tea quite a bit, because we've been mindful, there isn't anything that's coming out of this tea that is bitter. And you would know instantly if that first steeping was either oversteeped or if even one of those leaves received too much water. To the point where it would open up and you know give more flavor than its other tea leaves in the teapot you would know that certainly within the second steeping and you'd know that for two reasons one you might get very very bitter flavors in the second steeping if it was not evenly distributed and then two you might get sort of like stale or cooked vegetable flavor and that's very quintessential or very characteristic of a green oolong that's been overseed. You get this sort of like boiled spinach flavor. It's not a very nice flavor. It's almost like, you know, why like why people don't like eating their boiled vegetables, because it's kind of gross. Um, you would taste that in this, um, but we're not tasting that now. We're tasting still, it's very, very floral. You still get that really nice exotic fruit. It's still a good cup of tea. So, so we're going to put that off to the side. Um, can I ask you for two teas? Um, a phoenix and wu yi of your, of your choice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the next two teas that we're going to be brewing are going to be older 
styles, I'll call them older styles, because I don't know specifically what tea they will be. Um, Lena is going to present it to me slightly as a mystery and then we'll kind of play guess that tea. This is also part of Gong Fu Cha, of those who might not know. Um, this is a challenge that we're putting in front of us. Now, I, I will go so far as to guess the location of where this tea was produced. I'm not going to, as of right now, guess what tea it is. Um, part of it being that, you know, it's, it's I don't know, I, I could do this on my free time, folks. We don't have all day. Um, I do this occasionally. I will find a random tea in my tea collection or somebody will come up to me and go like, hey, well, I've got this tea and they'll present it to me and there will be a canister that has some name on it, but the tea inside that canister might not be that tea. It's very common for those who buy tea. Um, that's why I don't buy tea really, you know, from online unless I know the source, unless I've tried it before. So we're gonna try two teas. One's gonna be a Feng Huan Dan Song, a Phoenix Mountain Oolong from Chaozhou, a Dan Song Oolong, um, single bush, single grove tea. The second will be a Wu Yi Shan Yan Cha. And just for the sort of edification of the people here and sort of the practice for those of us at home, we're gonna kind of pick out what constitutes one style of tea versus another just by observing it. And core to understanding what Gong Fu Cha is, what we'll do is ask the question, what does it look like? What does it smell like? And if we even get into brewing, what does it taste like? And that's gonna tell us the answer to this. But before we get into what does it taste like, we wanna know what teapot it's gonna brew in. So I wanna know at that point where this is actually coming from. So Lena's been very, uh, She's set up a difficult challenge today because actually both of these teas look very, very similar. It's also kind of hard to see in the sort of light here. Um, I'm going to look at it. This one looks slightly green. Ooh, let me this hard. Yeah. Um, all right. I didn't mean to chop No, it's all right. That's, that's the Kung Fu. If I get this wrong in front of a video audience, that would be great. sticking my nose into the tea. So right now I have two teas. This one is, it doesn't present a very strong scent to it. And that's already kind of telling me what tea might be in front of me, all right? Uh, the leaves are quite dark. So this is pretty high oxidized. I don't know if we're gonna see that or not, but maybe we can. See it, folks? Is it a tea leaf? All right. So, I'm looking at that tea. It's kind of hard to see in the light. So I'm gonna pull back over here. It's a slightly high oxidized tea, maybe 40, 50 percent. Light fragrance. All right long twisted leaves this is an old style of producing oolong they started producing teas like this in the ming all right probably even before then but they were usually compressing it into a cake all right this tea also long and twisted all right slightly bigger actually and slightly toasty. It has a slight mineral note to it, all right? When I say mineral, think of I just pulled a stone off of a mountain, or, you know, I just pulled a stone out of a river, and it has that sort of like wet rock, wet specifically limestone or granite note. And if you don't know this, Maybe the next time you go to a spring, like a real spring that the water is coming out of the earth, smell the water. <laughs> it has a slight smell, but in addition to that mineral note, and in addition to that sort of smoky, toasty note, there's kind of a chocolate note. It's a carob. Um, and that makes me want to say, or even, and a slight spicy note. 
that makes me think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, I hope I'm not, is this your Wuyishan? This is a Wuyishan, oh good. Video audience, yay, I did it in front of you. Uh, um, now, I don't really know specifically which one this could be. It's a very large leaf varietal, so this could be something like a Shui Xian. Um, is it your, is it a Rogue Wei? No. Which one is it? Qilam. Oh, it's your Qilam, okay. Qilam Baniyan. Okay, so even, it's, it's quite hard. This is uh, pretty... Uh, uh, rare. It's, it's rare, it's also kind of one of those otter varietals. It's not one of the, the, the what is it, the Si Da Ming Cong which is the four famous bushes of Wu Yishan. Um, it's not one of those, but it's one of the varietals that will come from Wu Yi. Um, and all of those flavors that I described, even the leaf type, is what you're looking for in a Wu Yishan Oolong. Um, the reason why I sort of pulled this off to the side and why I said there isn't really much of a or there really isn't much of a scent going on here is because as a feng huan danzong and I, I can't really ID it right now but maybe it's like a mi lan shan or a huang zhi shan if, if I brew it, it we'll... you will probably okay. need to try it I, I wonder if you can recognize it when you brew it I used to be better at this <laughs> um, we'll, we'll find out so with that we'll brew this and we'll find out So, why I couldn't smell so much from that Chaozhou Feng Huan Danzong is because really good Feng Huan Danzong doesn't really give off a scent. If you go to Chaozhou, if you do what I've done and that's, and, and what Lina has done and that's, you know, stick your face into a canister of tea and you do that day in, day out, one, you might get sort of exhausted by the process. You know, even drinking tea, like when I go to China, I'm drinking tea sometimes like 16 hours a day. That's a lot of tea, folks. You cannot keep focus. Your mind goes off into the stratosphere. Um, people hand you a teacup and it like flies out of your hand. You're so up on tea. But even amidst all of that, you need to be able to discern what tea it is. Is it really the tea that it's telling you it is? Um, what's the level of oxidation? What's the leaf type look like? And then finally, what's that final flavor? And with a Danzong Oolong, one of the problems, or not really problems, but one of the challenges you're faced with is that the leaf itself, until it's wetted, is not going to give you a sense of what it is. Um, there are some teas that will give you a little indication, but a lot of teas can also lie to you. I, I can't tell you how many times somebody put in front of me what they call a yashir xiang, and they're like, oh, it's really low oxidized yashir xiang, and it was just not even that. It was just a, you know, a tea that was posing as that tea. Um, and so what you need to do as a, as a tea drinker is kind of create what we call this kind of reference library in your head of what tea you've tasted, remember that flavor, and sort of bring that into the field as you go to places like China, as you go to places like Taiwan, even Korea, Japan, Nepal, India. Know the flavor of the tea and be able to recall it. It's very hard, but you also have the fact that memory and scent are very much intertwined, so you know, use that to your benefit. Correct me if I'm wrong. So, yeah. uh, the tea smells a lot. It almost means that it's a young. It's just made. And uh, yeah. in most of the areas, the real tea is kind of kept aside. So yeah. It's like six months to yeah. sell. Yeah. So, you do not, you, you shouldn't expect to smell a lot of like, flavor in a, in a good balance. There, good yeah. Product. Or, or yeah. yeah, what you're referring to is this sort of holding period or yeah. resting period that a lot of oolongs will undergo. Um, teas that were picked in the spring and processed in the spring might not be made available until the autumn. Yeah, exactly. um, a lot of wu yi oolongs I found to have this, and some some dan and, and certainly some 
uh, an qi jie guan yin, some high roasted jie guan yin, you won't even drink for the first year. Um, the reason why you do that is because there are a lot of, let's just call them crazy flavors, that will exist in that tea and will not dissipate until that tea has had a bit of age on it. And you'll see that, and I think you'll even see it in a tea like this, um, to be that case. And so, yeah, that will also affect the available floral or sort of, let's just say, fragrance of that tea from the very beginning. Um, it, it's, you know, it's not gonna give away all of its sort of demarcators all at once. So I'm loosely packing these leaves in. Fang uh, Huang Dan Song have very, very long leaves, very wiry, very thin, slightly reddish and green in the case of this leaf. Um, again, mid-oxidized, slightly higher oxidized for some Fang Huang Dan Song. They're usually in the 30, 40 range. This one might be a little bit more. I'm gonna wet the tea. Again, this is gonna kind of clue us in to what tea this might be. I did not do with this teapot or with this tea is I didn't scoop off any foam. Some tea makers will fill their teapot entirely and scoop off a layer of foam. This is really the tea oil that's coming off. Um, I don't do that. I like the tea oil, so I'm keeping it. Um, I won't, I did a slight rinse of this, but that shouldn't pull off much. So, is this a real wash? What is this? I mean, uh, it's a Basian. I thought you had a greener Basian. Is this your new or old one? This is my old one. Okay. Okay. I failed, folks. <laughs> On a live internet broadcast, I failed. It's a Basian. Um, Basian has this very kind of slightly orchidy, slightly oh, yeah, yeah. marital, not marital, what is it though? big magnolia kind of note to it. Uh, I guess Yo Hua Xiang. Yo Hua Xiang has a very distinctive pomelo flower flavor. It's much sharper. Yo Hua Xiang, which I have, is yes. much It's much sharper yeah, it's and has a citric note. This mm -hmm. does not have that citric note. No, yeah. Instead, what you'll find here is what I just mentioned, the sort of magnolia note. Um, there's also kind of an aged orange peel kind of thing kicking around in there, so. Some sweetness. Yeah. Ba Xian, for those who are not up on there, Chinese uh, means eight immortals. Um, if you could see into this teapot, I don't know if you can, don't worry. Uh, there's a large ring of bubbles that's forming around the rim. That's the tea oil, and now I'm gonna pour the boiling water over the top pour the rinse over the teapot. And we're gonna brew this really fast because this tea will open up very, very quickly. The difference between a Yo Hua Xiang, a Ba Xian, a, a Ya Shi Xiang, a Huan Zhi Xiang, all of these different Chaozhou Dan Songs, um, looking at the various types of leaf shapes, they're more or less the same. Some might be a little bit bigger, some might be a little bit greener. If they're greener, do a slightly shorter brew. Um, if they are slightly darker, I tend to push those. And the result tends to be a much more intense brew. What you'll see in this steeping, in the color, is something that's slightly lighter than our roasted oolong. Uh, from Anxi. These teas do not receive a very strong roast and instead receive a little bit more oxidation. Uh, the color is slightly pink, if you can imagine that. It's, it's not like a you know, pink rubber eraser pink, but it's, it's sort of like a, um, oh, it's like a coppery orange pink. 
don't know if you can see it from this, but trust me, folks at home, that's what we're seeing. And even drinking this, I think we kind of pushed it. I really want to push this tea next time. So we're going to do a longer steeping the next time. The, the real sort of objective goal, and I'm using those terms in, you know, big quotation marks is because when you look at Gong Fu Cha, we don't have an objective, we don't have a goal. We just have a, a, a method that is attempting to meet sort of apex. And that apex is movable, but that apex is informed by what we know about this tea. And if we know that there's a lot of flavor in this tea, what we're trying to reach is that point. And I'll say it's almost a singular point that all of those flavors present themselves. And the way that we do it with a tea like this is through very, very high heat and through a very, very controlled brewing time. But the true mark... Do I want more? Okay. Two teacups, folks. I double coffee. No, 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 it's fine. What you're trying to get is as close to revealing all those flavors at once. And I don't want to call that a goal. I don't want to call that an objective. I don't want that to be the mindset going into this. I don't want you to get fixated when you do this. What I want you to do is to realize that at some point in your practice, you will continue to make tea and you'll get closer and closer to reaching a point where you will naturally bring out the flavor of that tea. And by natural, I mean natural in the sense of, I don't need to think about it anymore. It becomes an extension of myself. When I brew this tea, what I know about this tea will show up in that teacup. So it is, at the end of the day, not just what's called the mastery of this tea, at least the full understanding of this tea. It's also kind of a little bit of an understanding of a self. And that sounds kind of hokey, but what that means is that you now know that the subtle movements in your hands, the sensing of the heat on the kettle, sound of the boiling water reaching that point where small bubbles move off the wall of the kettle and into the water where that boil turns from gentle to rolling all these things that you can sense with your body you can now translate into brewing a good cup of tea please yeah. I often meet with people who is um, asking for very precise recipes. Mm -hmm. How many grams, what the temperature, how many seconds, first sitting, second sitting, third sitting. Mm -hmm. And all there are all this available and you can kind of put it, there is so many different um, things which are going on around which have to be adjusted every time you bring it depending on hot outside or cold yeah. and stuff like this. Yeah. So, um, how would you, uh, um, what is your opinion about like the precise recipe and measuring and like clocking the brew mm -hmm. rather than feelings which you're saying yeah. and listening and kind of like intuition of brew yeah. and like these two approaches or yeah. are they growing from one to another yeah. at some point, or is it absolutely a different way of doing that? And yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I'll throw that question back to you with another question, and that is, when was the last time you had the exact same, in this case, Dashian Dan Oolong? All right, 
or let's just say the exact same oolong. Let's open it up. Why I ask that question is because in our lifetime, we will encounter hundreds, if not thousands, of different types of tea. And each tea, even if it's the same tea, like that Nishan, I've had Nishan since I started drinking tea. I'm gonna treat that Nishan ever so slightly different than the one that I had, you know, a year ago, two years ago. The weather was different this spring. You know, the leaves are darker green. They're lighter rolled. You know, all of these things. This one received a slightly higher heat than the other one. These leaves are broken. Anything that you want to attach a fixed recipe to will only take you so far. And so when you're beginning, it's helpful initially to look at tea as this is a recipe. The problem is, is that you, if you attach yourself to the need for a recipe, you can only go so far. Um, I'll make the analogy and it's gonna get really out there really quick. Um, when I started meditating, you know, my mind was everywhere. I was like, oh, you know, can't stop thinking about the bird outside or the people chatting across the room or, you know, somebody's cell phone went off. So somebody said, well, just count your breath. And all of a sudden things got really clear for me because I had one inhalation, two inhalation, three inhalation, and so on and so forth. And that's what I ended up fixating on for many, many years, was this number roll constantly going. What it didn't help me with was, so what do I do after I'm thinking about numbers? You know, what sort of epiphany am I gonna have between number five and six. All I was focusing on were numbers. And I see this happen a lot in tea people. And that is, I have X amount of grams of leaves of green tea. If it's a green tea, I need this temperature and this time. I need this teapot and I need this type of kettle. And all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's like it's less about the tea at that point. All of the things that went into that tea are now pulling away from the tea. And I'll tell you this much, if you get fixated on that, and then somebody says, well, I've got, you know, this mason jar, can you make me some tea? All of a sudden, you're like, well, I can't make you tea. You don't have a teapot, you don't have a timer, you don't have, you know, the thing that tells me how hot it is. And all of a sudden, you can't make tea. And to complicate your very, you know, straightforward question, which it was, um, and a lot of people ask that question, at some point, you're going to have to let go of a recipe. And you can do that early on, or you can do that later on. Um, if you're going to do it early on, learn firsthand. How to brew tea and ideally learn it with somebody who already knows how to brew that tea because that's going to shorten your time and it's also maybe going to shorten the amount of you know I don't know zeros behind the number like the, the, the dollar amount that you'll have as one of my teachers said we all pay our tuition we all make mistakes we all you know, buy the teapot that actually doesn't make very good tea, you know. Um, but if you are able to approach tea as a means to experiment, better understand what I like to call, better understand what I like to call the extremes of tea, tea being brewed at its highest heat, and tea being brewed at its lowest heat, and knowing what's in between, then you'll know the variables that go in between that. So, does that answer the question? Well, yeah, so <laughs> the, the bottom line, 
you you are in Jewish New Brewer yeah. as I am as well. Um, there is a lot of people who say, well, I'm brewing a lot of coffee, right? you know, I'm measuring yeah. this and this yep. and that, and that's what they're trying to apply the tea, and that's what sure. I'm trying to explain that, but they're not doing this. So, um, yeah. so what do you do with that? How do you, how can you make tea not as an intuitional brewer? usually last like two and a half to three hours of just oh, yes. talking about tea and the end result is you know people who can sit and drink tea here but also people out in the world who can enjoy tea and like get a little bit of knowledge about tea elsewhere so um, we've been doing this for close to almost a year now and as a result you know we get hundreds People watching this and learning about tea. Now tonight, um, tonight we're going over what's called gongfucha, which is sort of the traditional method of brewing tea um, in traditionally Chinese way. When we talk about gongfucha, we talk about what we know is called gongfu, and that's like kung fu. Um, for those of us on the internet, we're doing a brief overview of this, which is good. Um, Gong Fu, simply translated, just means a skill acquired through being challenged. So what we're being challenged by is, currently right now, this tea, if you want to pass it around. Um, this was presented to me tonight by Lena as a mystery tea. We didn't quite know what it was. Um, she knew what it was, but... Um, I had to figure it out, and just by smelling it, by looking at the leaf type, um, we could figure out at least it was a tea that was made in Fujian, China. It was made in the mountainous region of Wuyishan, which has been making tea at least since the Song period, which is like, I don't know, 960 to 1279. Um, and from that, we could maybe figure out what specific variety of tea this is just by smelling it. Now, what we're gonna do next is take that knowledge and use that to brew this tea, which is, you know, imagine all the time and attention and sort of technical skill that went into actually making this leaf from, you know, growing, harvesting, roasting, oxidizing, not all in that order, but now we're gonna take all that and brew this tea. The long end of that, so yeah. <laughs> Do we have enough tea cups for you? One, two, three, you need four, this one. five. You need that one? Okay. You need this one. I need this one. This is so awesome. Are we on the internet right now? Yeah. You're, everybody's on the internet. <laughs> well, yeah. you're, you're not visible, Great. but yeah. you're yeah. fantastic. He's on the yeah. case. So, so. <laughs> This is live. I care about it. <laughs> yeah, it's live and then we preserve it. Um, I've been preserving it on YouTube and then she has this all on her Facebook page. So we have like eight, eight videos or nine videos, all of which are like three hours long now. So it's a lot of content. It's like reading a book every night. So, um, and prior to this, we did a sort of PowerPoint presentation. I know. Different genre. Yes. <laughs> For those who are visual learners. Um, 
So what I'll do first is we're using a teapot. Um, this teapot has been brewing specifically this type of tea since the early 2000s. So like 2003, I think I purchased this teapot and it's been brewing just this type of tea since then. Um, like a very nice cast iron skillet, it has seasoned this clay to the point where it now, if I do that, has a slight tea scent to it. And if you look at sort of the inner rim of this, it's like black with tea oil. So prior to that, it was like a lighter version of this color. This too is perfect. Uh, this teapot was handmade uh, from start to finish. And the potter made just this teapot when she was making it. This isn't mass produced. This is like, let me make parts specific for this teapot and put those together just for this teapot. Um, and they don't use a potter's wheel. It's all sort of hand kneaded and pressed and you know, put together. Um, and we've been making teapots like this at least since the 1500s. It's going to warm the teacups and pour it over the teapot. This is a really tiny teapot, or a teapot, so we'll probably do like two steepings and then warm those. So we get a nice cup of tea. Try to put all of these tea leaves into this teapot, and I'm pretty sure they will fit. You just have to do that correctly. So when we talk about gong fu cha, when we talk about a skill acquired through being challenged, which is what gong fu translates to, what we're trying to do is produce. Let's call them the optimal effects, the best results from a set of criteria presented to us. So if I had like a mason jar or a thermos or like a Starbucks paper cup, you know, the type they put their coffee into, I would want to brew that tea to the best of its ability using those means. And right now I have this little teapot. So how am I gonna do that? And the way that I'm gonna begin doing that is by arranging these leaves so that they all fit in the teapot. And then finally, I'm gonna take boiling water and rinse the teapot. And rinse the tea leaves. And I'm doing that partially so that we can smell the tea. I'll pass this teapot around. We can kind of get a sort of sense of what it's gonna taste like just by smelling it. Now the top likes to stay with the teapot, so be mindful of that. Pass it that way. It's also kind of hot, so like, you know, know that boiling water was poured into it. You can probably smell the smell. Yeah. So this is a mid-oxidized tea. This is the same type of tea, let's just say the same plant at least, that makes green tea, that makes black tea, that makes poor tea, and in this case that makes oolong tea. Um, it's just what you do with the leaves that will create the variety of flavors that we get here. Yeah. So boil the water, rinse the leaves, and then we're going to do a steaming. Bubbles that you see are tea oil that's coming off the leaves. And I pour hot water over the teapot and finally pour tea over the teapot. And all I'm waiting for now is for the water to dissipate off the teapot because it's boiling water that we just poured on there. And then there's a tiny little meniscus that was right at the tip of that teapot spout and that just pulled into the teapot. That means that the leaves are beginning to absorb the liquid that I just poured on them. And that means that this tea is pretty much ready to decant. 
go from teacup to teacup. And the reason why I do that is because that helps to distribute the flavor evenly. Do that one more time. Because Typically when you drink tea in this manner, you do it one cup at a time, one steeping at a time. So what you're tasting is the sort of layer that you're brewing from this tea, rather than like a big pot of tea where you're just getting like the general flavor of tea. Um, this way we're appreciating just that nuance of that flavor that you're able to extract. Um, with a small pot like this, you have a lot of control over what flavor you can pull out of it because there's less volume that that flavor has to go through. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know if we can make any more analogies, but you know, it's, it's at the same time, it also concentrates the flavor in the same way that like, let's say we're making an espresso. And you'd use close to the same amount of grounds that you'd make for an espresso, which fits in a little cup this big, um, as you would for like a single cup pour over. So, um, I'll show you all how to quote unquote appreciate the tea. There's a method to that too. are always this big, sometimes smaller, and the idea is that it's kind of like a, the idea of the tea in a cup, just enough to sort of get you an approximation or get you a sort of the essence of that flavor of that tea. So first we look at the color of the tea, we enjoy, you know, what it looks like. Every tea will have a different color. Uh, next, we enjoy the scent of the tea. And then finally, we sip the tea. And when we sip the tea, we slurp the tea. And we know it's slurping the tea. One of the reasons why we do this is because the tea is really hot and we burn our mouth. So we don't, you know, like we're, you know, one of my teachers said it's like you're kissing the tea. I don't know about that. But yeah. um, <laughs> the second reason why is because when you slurp, it atomizes the liquid and it pulls it up over the soft palate and that gives you greater access to more flavor. So as you do that, you get more flavor coming from that. What did the mama told you not to do? Yeah, <laughs> you should do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, should be toasty. Slightly incense in flavor. Interesting, sort of like, I don't know, what do you guys taste? Shouldn't give it away. Tastes better when slurped. Tastes better when slurped. <laughs> yeah. so. That's the basis of what we were doing tonight. We started this, what, at 6 30? I don't even know what time it is now. Um, and okay. so this is what we do. Almost every Wednesday, um, we might be trying out some Tuesdays too, where it's a little bit more quiet and serene here, if it's not quiet and serene enough. Um, and uh, each time we sit down, we focus on a different aspect of tea. Tonight we did uh, what we call Gung Fu Cha, which again is the skill and challenge of brewing tea. Um, and we're focusing on a regional specific way of brewing tea. If you go to North, no, forgive me, if you go to South, East China in the northeast region or corner of Guangdong province, you'll find the way that we brew tea tonight being practiced. And this is a style of brewing tea that's been around for at least 150 years, maybe 200 years. Uh, it's a style that has its origins going as far back as 6,000 years. If you really want to look at the history of tea. And if you can do this here, you can do this at home. It's one of the best ways of brewing tea, you know, and it can be quite easy once you master like little basic nuances. So, thank you for thank you. popping by. <laughs> and I got a phone call. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Bye everybody.